Hey pals, we believe in the value for value model. If you receive value from your goal with the heat crew, we encourage you to give a little value back. Check us out on patreon.com slash goal with the heat to find out more. Hello and welcome to Goal with the Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about season five, episode nine, titled Fruit of the Poison Tree. This is one of my more one of my favorite episode names. This has a great name. I don't know what it how what it has to do with the episode though. I'm confused on the symbolism. I, I guess here. it has some some legalese type thing. <laughs> May, oh, that's I, true. I guess that's what it. Yeah. They say it at the end of the episode. Gotcha. And it actually is in the business type phrase where if you get information on someone an ill gotten way. Yeah. And, I mean, I wouldn't have known that had I not looked at like the show notes. So I'm not claiming to be all smart here with the legal stuff. <laughs> it originally premiered on February 3rd, 1989. It is written by Rob Reagan, who's got one more episode coming, but he's a nobody. And it's directed <laughs> by Michelle Manning, who's got one more coming, but she's a nobody too. So <laughs> We're not going to talk about them. <laughs> you hear that, Michelle? Nobody. <laughs> I do like to point out when we do have a female director because they happen so infrequently that this is probably only like the fourth time that that's happened. What's up with that, Miami Vice, huh? <laughs> we're looking at you, Michael Mann. <laughs> yeah, so, we're looking at you. Before I get started, could check in to share each other's lives. I also just want to have a quick reminder that we have been on this bi weekly publishing schedule since Melissa and I have welcomed our fourth bundle of joy into the house. And I'm saying because we've welcomed as in we've recorded this in the future. <laughs> so we have re-recorded episodes. These are on a bi-weekly schedule while we get adjusted to new baby in the house. We will be back to our live weekly hot takes on what's trending in the news before we get started w- with an episode. But we're still on our bi-weekly schedule. This is probably close to one of the last ones that we'll have on the bi-weekly. And we'll switch back over to weekly. So I think since we can't talk about what's currently in the news, because obviously that's in the future, I think we should guess what's going to be in the news in the future. <laughs> so I, I personally am excited that got confirmation now in the future, a reboot of ALF. <laughs> I've been waiting for the ALF reboot to come out and I'm glad they finally announced it. And who would have saw that Magnum, the reboot of Magnum PI would actually be really popular. It's actually like number one on all TV channels right now in the future. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> and you know what? No one misses that other guy on Lethal Weapon. It's all good. <laughs> what other guy? <laughs> oh, what a sad state of TV that there's this many 80s movies or TV shows that are reboots. I know. It is. It's pathetic. They'll probably. It's the end of the line. Is probably a Crossing Jordan reboot. Ouch! <laughs> <laughs> Ouch! Come on. They would even have to try with that because of the way they ended it. So don't get him started. He knows all about it. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of like a Walker Texas Ranger reboot. Oh you know? God! It's like okay, guys, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> well, this story that we have this week from Miami Vice is kind of a reboot story, like an amalgamation of multiple previous episodes. So let's go break this one down. When we open up, the Vice team is staked out. Tubbs and Trudy at the train station, Crockett's out in his Ferrari, because standing at that long, like, oh, it's not. In this heat, I can't do that. <laughs> My hair. <laughs> All right, guys, normal rolls on this thing. I'm going to sit in the car. <laughs> Tubbs is going to hang out by the newsstand. Swiatek, why don't you be homeless again? <laughs> I don't think it was, he was pretending. I think that, that was from leftover from the last episode. Foreshadowing what's coming. <laughs> yeah, <to stand>. exactly. <laughs> Sonny says he's been working this cockroach for months and that this person that they're going after is dangerous, a wild card. The person they're trying to bring in is kind of a wild card. Dangerous, maybe? I don't know. Kind of get the hint, maybe? He's got big hair. <laughs> <laughs> the big point is that he's bringing in 200 pounds of coke. There's like panning shots of the area, the train. In case you forgot, Miami's got a train. I forget every time they show it. I'm like, what's that train doing there? Where are they at? <laughs> Gina gets out of a limo with a man, Roberto. So Gina's undercover. Black Widow opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, on the train, there's a man riding with a stuffed sloth. No, it's not a sloth. It's a it's a orangutan. It's, it's the, an orangutan. Yeah, yeah it's an orangutan. You know? And clearly, clearly, the orangutan is going to be important. <laughs> well, it's important to that guy, I guess. I mean, he's really close with that thing. <laughs> 
Skip is the man. He gets off and he goes off the train and goes over and talks to Roberto. They step aside away from Gina and the whole team's caught off guard. Like, did you see that? That was Skip. That's Skip Jordan. That's Skip Jordan. <laughs> he was busted for bringing in weed last week. What's he doing here? Did you guys notice Roberto is constantly, like, forever in this episode, uh, from beginning to end, in that ridiculous white suit? He never um, changes. L- like, yeah, like Travolta from Saturday Night Fever, like, uh, <laughs> or, or, like, Cross with like Liberace. I like, was just gonna say I just get a the very most outrageous vibe. white suit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is where it gets interesting. Sunny happens to stumble upon a homeless man's gonna hold up a hot dog stand. The most Miami thing ever. <laughs> a homeless man's gonna hold up a hot dog stand. There no that. one's gonna steal a hot dog while Crockett's <laughs> on the case. <laughs> Sonny pulls out his gun and stops the robbery, but then someone else sees that Sonny's got a gun and everyone takes off running. I just thought Floridians were used to, like, guns getting pulled out all over the place. And hot dog stands. (laughs) And hot dog stands being robbed. Him trying to break up the hot dog robbery (laughs) threw off the whole bus. Everything goes haywire. Basically, everything goes sideways. Everyone starts running. How important was it for him to stop this guy from stealing, what, 20 bucks from a hot dog cart? (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. I, you would feel like he would call it into the regular police, but also like good on Sunday night, he stops it right there. But he didn't do it discreetly. He pulled his gun out, held it to the man's back and was telling him, you're going to stop right now. It wasn't a very discreet operation instead of grabbing him and pulling him away or something like that. Letting the rest of the vice team, I think it's that Sonny insisted on he was going to be there when Roberto went down. Yeah, that's true. He definitely did it in a way that made it look like he was robbing the guy, robbing the hot dog cart. <laughs> yeah, so he was exactly. like second degree hot dog robbery. <laughs> I think is the technical term. So Roberto and and Gina start to run away. They get into this car. They drive away. Crockett pulls out his gun. He's going to shoot at the car, but he changes his mind because the windows are too dark. He can't see. He might hit Gina. But the driver of Roberto's car is the worst getaway driver in the history of getaway drivers because he crashes right into a construction zone. Not doesn't crash, just kind of hits some sand, comes to a stop. Roberto gets out and says, this is my perfect opportunity to recreate my favorite scene from Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Where he's slipping and sliding <laughs> in the mud. It's all up in the mud. And he's like, I'm a little rain cloud. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I almost think that it was intentional by the driver as if he thought he was going to hit one of those piles of sand and like dump it like a ramp, you know, kind of dupes a hazard it out of there. <laughs> the only problem is, is he was only going like five miles an hour. Like really should have hit the gas if that was the intention. <laughs> the the guy gets out and just kind of flops in the mud a little bit, uh, which is also strange why he insists on wearing this same white suit the rest of the episode. <laughs> like, did he just immediately dry cleaned after this? <laughs> I think whoever was playing Roberto had to get all his shooting done in one day. Yeah, so they're like, we don't have a lot of wardrobe for you. <laughs> they're able to arrest Roberto, and then we go to the opening credits. Before we get on with the rest of the episode, let's check in with our guest stars. There's a couple people I recognize here. A couple people where I was like, I, you were in that thing. I can't put my finger on what it was. I think one of them involves Mike Myers, maybe? What do you got for us this week, John? Guest stars a little bit better than last week. Like, we actually have some people who've been in things. <laughs> Okay, so let's start with Stephen McHattie. He plays Sam Boyle. He's a Canadian actor. He's oh, actually he's got a crap load of TV movie. So his career pretty much kicked off uh, with uh, 1976. He played James Dean in a TV movie, but he's been in a bunch of movies. Like his first actual credited movie was The People Next Door. He was also in Beverly, Hill- Beverly Hills Cop. He was the narrator in Basketball. <laughs> then the Fountain in 06, which is like three hours too long. Okay, so 2010, he's been in some, made some interesting role choice. So like in 97, he was in the movie Pterodactyl Women from Beverly Hills. <laughs> that title. <laughs> and then in 2010, made a handful of horror choices with the most Canadian film ever, Score, a hockey musical. <laughs> This movie is Broken, where he played a bouncer, and Red, Werewolf Hunter, so cap off some fantastic things. Some stuff you might actually know him from. He played the first, uh, the original Night Owl in the movie The Watchmen. He was in 11 episodes of 
Centennial from 78 to 79. And recently, he has a re- reoccurring role in Season 5 of Orphan Black. He also played Sergeant Frank Cascarella in the Canadian police drama Cold Squad. I only bring this up because <laughs> I watched... The name. <laughs> so I only bring this up. This is from 99 to 2001. I watched the uh, U.S. version of this show called Cold Case that came out in 2003-2004, which was a blatant ripoff of the Canadian show Cold Squad. (laughs) They were both about blonde female detectives who investigated cold cases, and they were identical shows, like same plot and everything. So moving on, next guest star is Jeff Meek, who plays Roberto Enriquez, again acting in TV with the role of Quinn McCleary on the CBS soap opera Search for Tomorrow. His movie roles include Condition with Denzel Washington, Johnny Handsome with Mickey Rourke and Forrest Whitaker, and Winter People with Kurt Russell and Kelly McGinnis. Now, I've heard of all those actors. I've never heard of any of those movies. <laughs> Like, like, how did he do it? How did he find the exact roles uh, with, like, the best actors that no one would remember? That is okay, an... Imp- so, aside from that... <laughs> sorry. That is an impressive list of people that he's worked with. Also, a group of people who have done a lot of forgettable stuff. True. <laughs> True. All right, as far as TV, uh, other than the soap opera scene, he starred in CBS's series Raven... From 92 to 93. All right. So let me give you the lowdown on Raven. Raven was about a martial arts venture that also featured humor, mystery, and secret societies. I'm listening. A former special forces who was also a ninja (laughs) who retires to Hawaii for his long lost son that also might have something to do with his old clan, the Black Dragon Clan. (laughs) I wonder why that only won one season, though. So. <laughs> so what was funny is that Raven was right after he was he starred in CBS's late night series, The Exile, in 91, which only lasted 13 episodes. <laughs> he all played Raiden and Shao Kahn in TNT series Mortal Kombat Conquest. This all sounds like this could be a lot of work that he's done with Eric Roberts. Yeah, I know. Eric Roberts <laughs> is in there somewhere. Yes. <laughs> so, and then on top of all that, he has performed on stage in over 100 plays and musicals. Our next guest star is Tony Sirico, who plays Frank Rano. And he played played Polly. He played Uncle Polly from The Sopranos. Um, oh. Polly. Yeah, from 99 to 2007, he voiced the character of Paulie in the 06 video game, The Sopranos Road to Respect. <laughs> I did not know they made a video game. I'm like, what? There's a video game? We are doing the wrong podcast. Go to uh, respect. I say the wrong one, but the next one we should be doing is about all the bad video games that came yes. out in the late 80s <laughs> and early 90s. Tony pretty much plays, uh, he plays an Italian. If you need an Italian, he'll play an Italian. <laughs> he can act with his hands. He can act and talk with his hands. He is Italian. He plays a lot of Italian characters, mostly Italian mobsters and gangsters. He's played them in at least 17 movies. He's played cops a couple times, a couple cooks, a couple boxing trainers, pretty much anything Italian, but prefers mobsters and gangsters. So he's got a crap load of movie credits, and they're all exactly what you'd expect. He was in Goodfellas, Copland, Dead Presidents. He played a mobster in A Muppet Christmas, Letters to Santa. (laughs) Playing himself. Because growing king as a teen and young adult, it was actually shot once by a rival Irish thug on the steps of a Catholic church. But before he got into acting, he was arrested 28 times and served multiple t- bids in prison. If I have to guess something about that and shooting was in front even of a Catholic alleged, church, rumored. If I have to guess, the only thing that uh, could cause an Irishman to shoot someone in front of a Catholic church would be something potato related. <laughs> Other than being arrested 28 times for, like, robbery and weapons charges, uh, he was also rumored to be an alleged member of the Colombo crime family. So he was legitimately playing himself over and over and over again. (laughs) Funny story about his Sopranos, he actually auditioned for the role of Junior, Tony Soprano's uncle. They offered him the role of Polly. He agreed to take the role only 
Lee if they promised that he wouldn't be a rat uh, at any point in the show. <laughs> Our next guest star is Anthony La- Latanzio, who plays Skip Jordan. I only included him in guest stars because he wouldn't really act in a whole lot. He would guest appear in Crime Story, and then he would also play Detective Number 2 in L.A. Takedown, the Michael Mann movie. And then he would shift focuses from acting... He would move behind the scenes as a construction, uh, as part of the construction department and be involved with the sets for movies like The Negotiator, Two Eyes, Last of the Mohicans, Heat, and and a ton of current TV shows too. And our last guest star, Amanda Plummer, who plays Lisa Madsen. She's a stage and film actor. You guys already hinted that you might know her from a certain movie. I know her from another one. Played Honey Bunny in Pulp Fiction. Yes. Um, And she might execute every last motherfucker one of (laughs) you. She was also in some other pretty uh, epic movies. So I Married an Axe Murderer, The World According to Garp, uh, Joe Verse the Volcano, and The Fisher King. Also, The Hunger Games Catching Fire, but we already mentioned the good ones. The World According to Garp has taught me a one valuable lesson, which is do not get a blowjob while driving. (laughs) Do not do that. It ends very badly. (laughs) You get in an accident. Very true. It's bad. It's bad. So Amanda... Also won uh, to award for 1982 performance in Agnes of God. So she's got some stage credits to her. She's won a few, I- I'm assuming, daytime Emmys for guest appearances in Law and Order SVU and uh, guest appearances on Outer Limits. She's also the only child of actors Christopher Plummer and, T- and Tammy Grimes. So if you're not, it doesn't jump out to you who Christopher Plummer and Tammy Grimes are. Christopher Plummer played Captain Von Trapp in The Sound of Music. Mm. And Tammy Grimes, actually, uh, Tammy Grimes in 1966 turned down the role of Elizabeth Montgomery in Bewitched to star in her own show, The Tammy Grimes Show. (laughs) <laughs> which only ran for a month in which they had ended up having four, six extra episodes that they had filmed. Four of them would go unaired, but she would, she would move on. There's your guest stars. When we come back from the opening credits, we're at the courthouse and Tubbs is on the stand and he's saying that they had received a search warrant to go after Roberto and to investigate his car. So after he rolled around in the mud and they arrested him, they went and searched his car. They have reason to believe he was selling coke. And so this is the prosecuting attorney. The DA is the one that's asking these questions. When Roberto's lawyer comes up, he says, so you did get a warrant. And Switek, the Stan Switek was the one that got the warrant, right? Like, yeah, of course. Can you take a look at this paperwork and look at this one? And they realize that the license plate number that Stan put on the search warrant that the judge approved does not match the license plate that was actually on the car. And so therefore, the search warrant wasn't for that car. And the case should be dismissed. My move would be this as a case of boys will be boys. Stan, after his rough week last week, he could be forgiven, right? Just he loved a single key. It was just, just one can't be key. that big of, that, of a deal. If he wasn't so busy gambling, he would have got the spelling <laughs> right. Should have checked it twice. Trudy would have never made that mistake. <laughs> I was waiting for that the whole time when they when they like went sitting down and talk to Stan, who was waiting for him downstairs, it's for Stan to be like, it was Trudy's fault. Ah, uh, it's okay. He just got screwed over by a lousy law panel. <laughs> Sonny couldn't wait to approach the lawyers either to say, you guys are swarmy and slimy. Like, this is what the lawyers are supposed to do. Like, they're hired by their by nice. the person that, that they're supposed to support. They did what they were supposed to do. But Amanda, she ain't taking none of it. She says... No, her co- cops murdered her daddy. So she she ain't playing by none of that. She says, you're the one that blew it. You had all the information. You had everything right. If you would have filled out that form right, we wouldn't even be here. So don't get up in my face about this. Which no one was in her face, though. <laughs> <laughs> she just inserted herself in there. <laughs> At the precinct, Dad. So back in the, the squad wa- room. We're making plans. Don't worry about Gina. She'll be fine. She's okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. She's off dating the drug dealer, murderer, or something. Like, she'll be yeah, okay. Yeah, like, she can handle herself. No. She's good. <laughs> Dad feels like that they lost her edge, but throughout the course of the meeting, say, okay, you know what? Gina will be fine. Leave her with, with Roberto. She'll be okay. You all go after Skip, because that's the person who actually has the drug. So you go after him, because what they arrested R- Roberto for was just one kilo. And that's what was inside of that. I'm so called a sloth. Deal with it. It's inside of that sloth was just one kilo. It's an orangutan. It might is. As well I be know. A, it might as well be Clint Swift's partner. <laughs> 
Skip actually still has 199 kilos, so go after him. So I'm going to come back to that. That's a, that's a point of contention that's going to come up later. Meanwhile, in the mm-hmm. bathroom, Roberto's lawyer, Boyle, he's in there washing up. Two men come in. They push the bathroom attendant out, and then Frank Romano comes up and starts talking to Boyle and says, Hey, I thought we were partners. Turns out one yeah. of my partners is dirty. Get a, hey, you gambling with my meatballs? Bing, <laughs> come on. Hey. <laughs> That was, that was awesome. <laughs> Forget about it. <laughs> Frank says, you "Try I, here." <laughs> Frank says, "I know that you make a, you put on like a million dollars a year. So why are you stealing money from your partner, me, Frank? Why are you stealing mo- money from me? I know you bought that trip to Vegas. I know you took that five hundred thousand dollars, and now I want you to pay me double that. I want a million dollars." By Friday. Let's beat you up now. <laughs> <laughs> Out at Roberto's, Gina's in the hot tub while Roberto is talking to one of his partners to say, I'm going to kill whoever ratted me out. They can finish the deal with Skip. And then he kind of changes this his scene mind. Is like a, this seems just like a nature documentary. The Black Widow attracts her prey. She brings him in. <laughs> oh, what? Tantalizing. <laughs> then after Cortis, death. <laughs> How much sex do you think she had to have with him? That's my, I kept thinking that the entire time. How much sex does she have to have with she Roberto? Been, she must have been so disappointed she didn't get to kill this one. Yes. I have many questions about that. I'll come up again in the next scene where we see Gina with Roberto. Like dancing. Yeah. Because, I, I, yes, I want to talk about that. But let's let's get to that scene first. Come table that. Table that one. <laughs> <laughs> Roberto changed his mind. Like, hey, actually, it was kind of a... Okay, because I got off, I only lost one kilo. I'm gonna go get my other, my other 199 from Skip. Gina comes in and she's laying it on thick with Roberto. Hey, baby, what are you doing? What's going on? I'm just trying to be a service to you. What do you want to do this afternoon? He's like, let's go. Maybe I'll get my business done and then we'll go escape to the Bahamas. She's like, that sounds good to me, baby. Which seems really relaxed with Gina because normally she's not okay with sleeping with the people that she's investigating but this sure seems like yeah but she's she's okay with it she's had to practice at it now and so you know with practice comes perfect (laughs) out of boils he's calling around asking for loans he owes a million dollars to a mobster who's gonna kill him so he's trying to do what he can (laughs) yeah oh yeah can you give me a million dollars about 100k how about ten dollars come on i'll take anything (laughs) amanda comes in and she offers to take boil for a drink she's obviously like Got a thing, yeah. She had a thing for him, him. and it's like yeah. I guess for sexual me, harassment goes both ways, guys. <laughs> it's for me what it is like. God, it also he was signals. He was her dad's best friend. I mean, come on. <laughs> what it signals to me is like it's not that like she's trying to; it's that they have a relationship. Yeah, but you. But later, it kind of falls apart when she says she always wanted a relationship with him. So I'm not sure where it actually is, but it sure feels like they already have one. This is where we also get a little bit of more information about. Her father had died. Boyle's always been there to take care of her. They really see each other as family. At an airport, the duo are undercover. So this is like the next day. They're undercover. They're going to talk to Skip about this deal. So they're following up with what Castillo had wanted them to do. Skip wants a high price. So they set up a time to go run a job for them. It's going to happen at 3 p.m. Like later that day, I think is when it's going to happen. I, I don't like Skip. He's not my, I don't like this new pilot. I miss our old pilot. What, Jimbo? Wasn't it Jimbo, <laughs> our, old, our old pilot? Any pilots should only be named Jimmy. Those the only <laughs> only Jimmys for pilots yes. are trustworthy. So we jump cut and we're to skip getting beat up by Boyle. Or Boyle at least comes in. He says he wants to see the drugs. And this is, my, this is the best. Skip says, all right, here it is. 198 kilos. Question. <laughs> Shouldn't it be 199? Because only one of them. Where's the other kilo, Skip? <laughs> hmm, Skip. <laughs> Skip. Skip had a party last night. <laughs> Skip can't be uh, held responsible for missing kilos. They've been in this plane for like a week. Come on. <laughs> Lucky it wasn't 197 and a half. <laughs> for some reason, then Boyle just decides to attack him instead of like, hey, why don't you give it to me and I'll go deliver it to Roberto, which would have been a lot easier to do. But he decides to attack Skip. They scuffle. Boyle Get Skip onto the ground, shoots and kills Skip, freeze frame and go to commercial. I'm not thinking that the lawyer was the one that made the mistake here. I- I'm thinking Skip made the mistake. Skip had all the leverage. Skip had the 196 kilos of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> this seems like poor planning on his part to just let him show up and then 
And, and then, yeah, they, they just wrestle, and then he accidentally shoots them. It's like, oh, now I have 195 kilos of drugs. <laughs> At a classic Miami yuppie life party, house party it looks like, not at a club, it's like a house party, Gina is there with Roberto and they're dancing. Well, I should say Gina is dancing. Roberto's doing his best not to fall over. <laughs> yeah, she's standing there watching. So guys, how long do you think it would take to sell uh, $1 million worth of Coke at this party? <laughs> 194 kilos. <laughs> we still got 183 left. <laughs> yes. Gina is working hard. She's dancing. She's like, I only like to dance for you. She's all over him. Roberto gets a phone call. and He looks like he's wearing the puffy shirt from Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> Roberto says on the phone he wants to know where his merchandise is and set up a meeting at the parking garage tomorrow at 3 p.m. No word on exactly what it is. He just says it on the phone. And then Roberto and Gina go to take a quote unquote take a nap. Let's, okay, now this is where I want to talk about Gina. Let's talk about Gina. This is definitely different than the way we've seen Gina portrayed before in these stories. She's conflicted. She keeps them at arm's length. She knows how to seduce them. But not actually have mm -hmm. to complete it, yeah. This is clearly implying that Gina is sleeping with Roberto. Yeah, because what are they gonna are they really gonna go take a nap? <laughs> she's been with him for weeks too. Like she's been working this case for weeks. There's no way she's holding him off for weeks that she's like pretending that she can't sleep and with typically him. in these stories we see her conflicted where it's gonna happen and then she see her she's like I can't believe I got in this scenario. Necessarily. Not necessarily. When they are attractive enough, she's she's moved quicker with just think about the IRA guy. Just remember Liam Neeson's character. She moved super quick with him. You well, know, yeah, so Liam like Neeson. maybe she's just really <laughs> attracted to Roberto. I mean, I know it's skipping ahead, but why does she live in a gigantic house like that? That was her house. They say later on when it were blew up that that was her house, like at her own house. Where is she getting the money for that? When Tubbs doesn't even have a house, he lives in his car. <laughs> Crocker lives in a car. Stan lives in that crap apartment. Trudy lives in that terrible hey, hey, decorated wait, 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 apartment. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We, we've already determined that, that Crockett's a multi million millionaire and he's got like three <laughs> houses now. I, I don't know any better, but I have a, I'm assuming that this isn't leading to some change in Gina's behavior, that there's some like burnout thing that's happening for her and that's how we got here. But it, it, Having never seen the show, I will say it makes me feel like that that's what's happening because we saw a little tip of the hand for Stan. Yeah. Where he's, he's they see him making a phone call in Boroska. Yeah. And then all this, yeah. Uh -huh. And then, then we find out later that he's got this big gambling problem and stuff. So this would make it seem like there's something wrong with Gina because this is way outside of character for her. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, and I was wondering, like, Melissa, you hinted later in the scene when you see her big old house, she just come back from shopping and they're unloading all of this. And it made me wonder, like, is she spending Roberto's money? Yeah, that's what shopping? I thought. I thought she was going to Roberto's house and she was like pretending to be shopping and stuff when it when it happened. And then when they said later on, mm -hmm. like, no, this a cop's house was blown up. Like, what? That was her house? How did she afford that? How did she make that? Damn, she <laughs> wasn't that vivid. <laughs> <laughs> At the airport, the deal are waiting for Skip, like to see other they Skip, but they get a call to say it's dad that Gina checked in and said the deal's going down at 3 p.m. at this parking garage to do a race off. We go over to the parking garage. And the whole vice team is there. They're watching. There's guys, the deal. Guys, does dad make all of his phone calls in his office standing? <laughs> He's got stuff to do. I, I, just, I started noticing that when I saw it in this episode, I was like, wait a minute. Every time he called him from his office, he's like standing, standing, staring out the window. He's always deep in thought, three steps ahead. <laughs> I wonder if I can sniper this person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a limo's there at the parking lot. A brown car comes pulling in. They're radioing all to each other. Roberto gets out, looks in the trunk, then gets into the limo, and the limo starts to drive away. So the vice team thinks they have something here. They race in, pull out, go to pull out Roberto, but Amanda's inside of the limo. She says, this is ridiculous. You've been harassing my client. Over the trunk, nothing's there. It was 100% a setup for Roberto to figure out who the rat was in his network. Oh, yeah. And they were perfect. Got him. The old switcheroo. Not only did another bus go wrong, but they, she also added a harassment complaint. So now they really can't are going to have a hard time going after Roberto. And I feel like I'm forgetting something. Someone that might be undercover. Um, yeah. Oh, crap. Gina. <laughs> they realized 
that now they he knows it's Gina. Gina is the one that's dirty here. So they go race off to go to Gina's mansion out on South yeah. Beach. Yeah. And Gina's there. She's pulling up. She's got a lot of gifts to unpack. Little Nikki, the neighborhood kid. She she's gonna pay him a few bucks to give her a hand to bring everything into the house. Unfortunately, well, Nikki's for Nikki, so helpful. <laughs> I thought he was just being nice. He was like, "No, I'll help you." Like, I think she hands him a couple bucks. She like gets out and it's like, "Here, can you give me a hand?" And she like puts something into his. Oh, hand. okay. I thought she, I it, thought he it, was just being it, a nice kid. Maybe the keys. Well, wait, yeah. wait. Did she gave him the keys. He's gonna park her car or something. No, like to get into the house, like because he's bringing the packages into the house. She's got it a- doesn't really matter because poor little Nikki. He goes, he brings the boxes in, he comes out, he thinks he left one on the stoop, goes to grab it, and boom! Goes up in a million, billion little pieces. No more little Nikki. <laughs> Gina's obviously beside herself, and the duo show up just in time to stop Gina from running into the fire. I mean, what was she going to do? I don't know what she was going to do for Nikki. Unfortunately, Nikki. Oh, oh, yeah, blowed up, like nothing left of him. Like, there wasn't even a shoe. <laughs> Sorry, Nikki. Not only did you get way. blown up in 30 seconds into this episode, but you didn't make it into guest stars. So, <laughs> yeah, you obviously didn't do much no, after this. No. <laughs> <laughs> didn't even make it in, into uh, co stars. So, yeah, that, I, 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 don't, I didn't even see like a credit there. <laughs> Poor little Nikki. Gina driving like the convertible Chrysler LeBaron or Sob or exactly whatever. That's what she's driving. <laughs> <laughs> figures. Totally figures. Like it just she, fit. Like as soon as I was like, yeah. John, she got older. She changed her name from Kitty to Karen, <laughs> and then started driving a white ice little, little Baron. Baron. <laughs> At Boyle's office, Sonny is pissed. He's coming in there to come talk to Boyle. Amanda's the only one that's there, though. He's telling her, "How can Boyle defend Roberto or your office defend Roberto? He just killed a twelve-year-old. He blew him up with military-grade C4." And Amanda says, "I don't know what you're talking about." Sam or Boyle would never be involved in anything like this. He's a good man. He was there. He's always been there for me. You are out of your mind. At the same time, Boyle was on the phone with Roberto. He tells him that Skip skipped town <laughs> with his drugs. There's no other way to say it. <laughs> Boyle tells Roberto to calm down, keep your shoes on, think like a businessman, just pay him the million dollars to get your 183 kilos back. <laughs> And then, because what's, what's left is worth 20 times that, and then I'll be your middleman for you, and I'll bring you back all 172 kilos. <laughs> yeah, God, how many times have we heard this advice? Hey, just give me the million dollars, and then I'll just take care of everything. Don't worry about it at all, buddy. I'll make it all better. And then when he asked, why should he trust him? He's, well, you know, lawyers on her, because, you know, there's this code of conduct, you know, lawyers, you know, they can't lie ever. <laughs> And so now we go to that night. Boyle is there having dinner with Amanda. He's explaining something about short hairs and sexual assaults, and I don't know what. Why the hell does he, he talk? On. He talks like the chicken lawyer from Futurama. <laughs> Why is he talking like he's a, like from the country, like Western or something? That he done good. <laughs> <laughs> I might just be a small town chicken lawyer, and I know my way around <laughs> the courtroom. <laughs> And every night, it's the same old stories, you know, like, shut up already. We get it. You're a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to eat my chicken parmesan here. <laughs> Amanda then says that Detective Crockett came by and talked about this 12-year-old kid that got blown up. He thinks that Roberto did it. And Sam says, you can't get emotionally involved in everyone's wheelings and dealings. <laughs> it's fine. Like, I'm sure Nikki's fine. Just leave it alone. It's totally fine. It's not my fault that Everyone wants to blow the undercover cop up with C4. And man's like, I didn't say nothing about C4. How did you know exactly what bomb? Was? She got blown up with a bomb. And the bomb was there with C4. And then he tries to work his way out of it by saying, hey, you know what? Bad people exist. You can't get involved in it. Like, it's <laughs> yeah, totally he doesn't, fine. D- he doesn't deny he yeah. knows. He's like, no, I'm not going to do that. He's the worst. He, for being a lawyer for criminals, he is the worst criminal that have, has ever existed. <laughs> He's also the worst liar. <laughs> uh, like, the two things that really jumped out with me on this is that, one, she tells him that they didn't actually kill, that they killed a 12-year-old boy and not the cop. No one seems to care after this. Like, oh, we missed. Oh, well. <laughs> no one ever takes a shot at Gina again. You know, and I was a little surprised about about that and then the second thing is like he's got the worst defense in the world this defense is well you know over time 
you'll become a cook too. You know, <laughs> Amanda says you cash the check while you did this, and then she storms out. So I guess later that night, then that's when Roberto has the cash exchange with Boyle, so that Boyle can go do can go buy the drugs back. So the next oh, morning, oh yeah, big old grin, like woohoo! <laughs> I, I mean, I'll take care of everything. Even later, I guess maybe like that's like three a.m. now. <laughs> no idea. Amanda calls Sonny and he comes over alone to talk to her and she says, here is Sam's book of all of his client information. Go ahead and look through this. This is illegal and it's going to get me disbarred and it's violating client lawyer privilege. But go ahead and do it but anyway. go ahead and look through this and just don't tell anyone that it was me that you got the information from. And Sonny's like, don't worry, you're good. I won't <laughs> say a word. Sonny's all distracted looking at this folder and the whole time he's looking at this folder, she's like, Huh, is this about my dad here? Huh, there is this other thing about my dad. Look at this, this telegram. Huh, what are these gloves doing in here? <laughs> and Crockett, the whole time Crockett's oblivious. Look, here's a phone number. Here's a list of phone numbers. I've got them. <laughs> Has no idea. that She's basically figured out that her father was murdered by this guy. Exactly, exactly. All of a Sonny is just fo- focused on him. And then he says, hey, you good? She's like, yeah, okay. All right, see you later. And then he runs off to the next morning. We're out in the middle of the swamp somewhere. There's a lot of slow-mo. In this yeah, no, yeah, that was really weird slow mo. <laughs> yeah, so this episode, this area in the swamp goes into super slow mo. Some shack out in the glades, Tubbs sneaks up. They do what they normally do, which is Miami Vice freeze, bang, 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 <laughs> shoot everybody. <laughs> Not even a chance for him to respond. <laughs> Roberto tries to run. He run, he goes out the back door. Gina's there waiting for him, and she's ready to Black Widow. She's Roberto ready to shoot him right like yep. Miami Vice style. <laughs> and she's like, "Give me a, give me a reason." Go ahead, do it, do it. And now she's all incensed, but this was not, we didn't get the rest of the story here. They. This is a shortcut that the writers and the directors did to make it so that it was okay with how they were having Gina perform earlier in the episode. This is a shortcut to make it like, see, look, Gina's still the same. Yep, she sold her body again for Vice, <laughs> but see, look, she's she, <laughs> and she's angry about it. So it's all good, but they, they, I mean, uh-huh. this is shortcuts of shortcuts of shortcuts yeah, exactly. is what they did here to Gina. You know she wanted to kill him. She should have shot him dead right there. Come on. End the episode <laughs> right. If only there was some, like, sections in the story earlier to show her and Ro- Roberto's relationship and not just the two times where they were setting up to go have sex where she gets out of the hot tub and then when they're dancing at the party. Just, you know, some things in between to kind of insinuate what's happening with her and roberto they didn't have time for that <laughs> no we gotta blow up nikki <laughs> okay so we gotta deal with polly now guys and just leave this guy walking around talking about meatballs and stuff <laughs> at a different so, parking garage so sam has still got to deal with his million dollar debt to polly of course he's got the million dollars um that he's gripping off but he also has a van full of what I'm assuming is 172 kilos of coke. (laughs) Boyle is the worst criminal. He says, I got your money. I also have 200 keys. So he inflates how much he actually has. I have 200 keys inside of this van too. So he he says it's worth $20 million. And he's got a million dollars in cash. He has 200 keys of coke that his client doesn't need anymore but then he says i will sell yeah. it to you to absolve my million dollar debt plus six hundred thousand dollars extra what you can ask for like ten million dollars here how are you gonna sell this for 1.6 million yeah doesn't he know that 165 kilos of coke <laughs> even back in the 80s is worth like 50 million <laughs> Frank is like, of course, yeah. I mean, this is a screaming deal. I'm going to have a huge markup on this cocaine. <laughs> You're basically giving it to me for free, but can I pay you later? Which is a good, good choice by Polly because now Polly's going to take the van and we're never going to see him again. <laughs> there we go. There goes the Polly storyline. Him and his meatballs drove off the van full of coke. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda was watching from afar, though, so she sees this deal go down. At the courthouse, which I'm always disappointed that it's not the prince room in the courthouse. It's always just a regular courtroom. Never get that one back. No, we're never going to get that one back. Yeah. Sonny is testifying, and the prosecutor's asking, how do they know where Roberto was going to be? And he says he had an anonymous tip. Someone's very trustworthy. But the warrant is written to say I will not disclose who that person was. So then that And already I'm feeling like this is a trap. Exactly. Because then Sonny gets off the stand and the defense calls Amanda. And she immediately says, I'm the one that gave the information to 
the detective. And I knew I shouldn't have done it, but I did it anyway. So here's where we are. And of course, Roberto's lawyer says this is fruit from the poisonous tree. You should dismiss this case. And the judge says, you violated attorney-client privilege. This case is d- dismissed. I'm not going to stand for that. Crockett. <laughs> this is like the third time in the episode the Vice team has just been made of, just made fools of. We we have the hot dog cart incident at the beginning. <laughs> then we have the old switcheroo in the middle. Now we have good old uh, attorney-client privilege trap. They've <laughs> just got them coming and going all episode. <laughs> the lawyer's office, a man that comes in and tells Boyle, hey, I'm the one that got Roberto off. I went and testified on his behalf. And then I told Roberto afterwards that you sold his Coke. See you later. It's like, you know what you've done? It's like, I know exactly what I've done. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Obviously, she figured out he killed his dad, and she came up with this scheme while Crockett was digging through looking for phone numbers, <laughs> and she executed it flawlessly using Crockett to get everything lined up, and as we were about to find out in the next few scenes, everything goes according to plan. Yeah, that's exactly what she tells Sonny that night when Sonny comes over, because he just figures it out slowly, and then he comes over to talk to her about it, and that's what she tells him, that I he killed my dad. The telegram was from two hours before he actually died. But then Sonny's able to work her down, and she eventually caves and says they're at Miller Airfield because he lays it on thick with her on the guilt trip that your dad would have wanted to do what was right because your dad had the reason why Sam killed him is because he had information on a quote unquote very respectable person. And so Sam k- killed him for that. Yeah, which w- which I think a lot of that, like the last like 30 seconds of that scene was very unnecessary. I mean, she basically goes, now that I think about it after the fact, it was almost like he was trying to tell me that his friend was dirty and was trying to kill him. <laughs> In hindsight, oh, everything pointed to Sam. So now we're going to go to the last scene of the episode. We're at the airfield. Sonny is racing to get there in time. But don't worry, because when they get to the airfield, where Sam gets out of his car and Roberto immediately shoots him. He gets like two steps out of the car <laughs> and he gets shot. He's done. <laughs> Super quick. Like, he immediately shoots him, and then he shoots him, like, two more times in the next like, 10 seconds. He's trying to get the oh. information out of him where his coke is. But before that can happen, the duo come charging in, shoot out, lots of slow-mo. Tubbs blasts one person with the shorty shoddy. Love to see that thing get <laughs> used every once in a while. And then Sonny plays hide-and-seek with Roberto. He eventually catches up. And they actually arrest him. They don't kill Roberto. They arrested him. Well, Gina wasn't there to shoot him. <laughs> See, that's what we get for having a failed director. <laughs> <laughs> Boyle dies on the tarmac. Amanda comes walking up crying. She can't believe that there's Sam there dead in the middle of the airport. Sonny turns to her and says, How do you think she it even was? there? How is she even there? <laughs> and Crockett guess, literally bring her with him in his Ferrari? I think because she For knew what where reason? he was. She followed, but obviously Sonny's in the Ferrari, so he's able to haul ass and get there. So, oh, so she met him down there after the fact? Yeah, yeah. She came She came on her own, but she followed the speed limit and stopped the stoplights and stuff. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, just, just, just she needed confirmation that Sam was really dead then, I, I take it. Yeah, and she's surprised, and Sonny says, how'd you think it was? look pretty and then we slowly fade out and that's the end of the episode i still was hoping that gina would shoot and kill (laughs) roberto uh in the end of the episode i'm also still very very puzzled at why lisa was even there at all like it just makes no sense he knew it was at the airport she had no business going there well last time last episode i basically gave my whole final thoughts in this time right (laughs) here so i'm gonna hold off this time I'm giving my final thoughts on this. Let's go first talk about this week's music. I think we're on a trend here. So let's go take a look at this week's music. All right, John. Last week, we had a time where we had a couple artists that we had kind of heard from before. I hope that's not going to be a trend, is it? Oh, so you're a trend. Almost like this would be another music repeat. Like last week was kind (laughs) of a repeat because we had already talked about them. Uh, I, I, I don't know. We talked about YouTube or Robert Plant before. Uh, I mean, those things uh, sound familiar. Maybe uh, I don't know, like three times each. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I guess uh, let's try and talk of them again. 
Yeah, our, our music was Desire by U2. U2, who also appeared in our music segment from the episodes Lombard, Lombard The Prodigal Son, Let's Play, this, their fourth episode, their final episode. But it feels like so much more, because we've also talked about Bono and The Edge in other people's music segments, like Sheena Easton and other people because they were involved in other bands and stuff. So yeah, it feels more like we've talked about them about eight times. So I've already talked about Bono. I've already talked about The Edge. I've already even talked about Larry Mullen. So I guess let's talk about Adam Clayton, the bassist. He's been with YouTube. He was a co-creator of of the band so been around since the beginning and part of 14 of their albums so uh he remained a bachelor for many decades including dating british supermodel naomi campbell in the 90s damn didn't get down or married until 2013 when he married human rights lawyer mariana tashera cara d <laughs> Caro- uh, Just keep going. She's Brazilian, <laughs> folks. I'm sure is, she's a. I'm sure she's gorgeous. My favorite part of the my two favorite things in music is always the previous band names and complicated names John's forced to say. <laughs> that, that's Adam Clayton. Otherwise, you know, pretty much just. Kind of involved with you two. Uh, let's see some other YouTube stuff. Let's see. Um, did you guys hear that Paul Henson said that this might be their last tour? Mm. You know Paul Henson. You know Paul Hen- H- Henson is right. Houston. Yeah, you know Paul. You know sometimes they call him Paul. Paul though. Okay, so enough YouTube. I think it's time we put YouTube to bed. Let's talk about "Walking Toward Paradise" by Robert Plant. Robert Plant, obviously the lead singer of the probably the greatest band. In rock and roll history, Led Zeppelin. And we talked about Robert Plant in Junk Love, and we will be talking about him again in the episode Freefall. <laughs> talk about good old Robert Plant and still leave us with a little bit of detail to talk about in Freefall. Led Zeppelin, uh, aka the New Yard Birds, as I know them. <laughs> he had various jobs while he was per- per- pursuing music, including laying tarmac on roads for a construction company. And I love this construction company's name. He worked for Wimpy Construction. <laughs> he also worked at Woolworths for a while. He also cut three very obscure singles for CBS Records. And that was when he got introduced to John Bonham. So he said numerous bands, uh, my favorite being the Crawling King Snakes. And then both him and Bonham would then join the Band of Joy from 66 to 68. Now, the Band of Joy would have a resurgence from 77 to 83. What happened in that time period? Well, around that same time period is when Led Zeppelin broke up. So, obviously, Robert Plant trying to go back to the Band of Joy. Well, and that's not actually the only thing that happened in his life in 1977. In 1977, his five, Robert Plant's five-year-old son died of a stomach virus rather suddenly mm. while he was on tour in the U.S. He was one of three of his kids with then-wife Maureen Wilson. It wrecked him. I mean, it crushed him. On tour at a concert in Cincinnati, he got one phone call about his c- kid being sick, and then the very next phone call was basically finding out that he had passed away. It would almost cause him to ban, like, Led Zeppelin to break up. It would lead him to the song All of My Love, one of my favorite songs of Led, Led Zeppelin's. And he would write a number of songs throughout his career about his son. So, but that was around the same time that he tried to bring back the band to joy. And ultimately, by 1980, Led Zeppelin would split. So after Led Zeppelin broke up in 80, still occasionally collaborated with Jimmy Page. They would have a band much later in the future called Plant and Page, no, Page and Plant. But before that, like immediately after Led Zeppelin broke up, they actually collaborated and created a short-lived supergroup called the Honey Drippers. The Honey Drippers uh, released one album, uh, which featured hits of a remake of Phil Phillips' Sea of Love and a cover of Roy Brown's Rockin' at Midnight. But that's actually kind of, if you're a hardcore music nut, that's one of the things is to try and get the album, one of the Honey Drippers albums, because there are so Mm -hmm. few out there. And then he would go on to have a very successful solo career. And then I made the comment of... Led Zeppelin, you know, I know them as the New Yardbirds. And that's because when Jimmy Page, who was 
in the Yardbirds at the time, him and uh, I believe Peter Frampton were searching for a replacement lead singer. They originally came across the their first choice, Terry Reed. And Terry Reed would turn them down and he would point them toward Paige, who at the time was playing with a band called Ob's Tweedle. <laughs> Gonna repeat that there. Playing with a band called Ob's Tweedle. <laughs> and he happened to be doing a show at a teacher's training school. And Peach would and Peter would go and, and watch him and, and then invite him to audition, in which Plant would sing the Jefferson Airplane song, Somebody to Love. That's how he got the gig. He would bring Bonham with them. Eventually, instead of being the new Yardbirds, they would become Led Zeppelin and be one of the most epic bands ever, including John Bonham being incredibly underappreciated as probably one of the greatest drummers. If you don't think he's one of the best drummers ever, go back and listen to When the Levy Breaks. Just tell me. There you go. Uh, a little bit more, Robert Plant. And just to cap off, the fantastic band names, you know, the Crawling King Snakes and Band of Joy and Ob's Tweedle. From 2002 to, to the present, Robert Plant's new band, the Sensational Space Shifters, <laughs> released an album. Hopefully we get a second album from them. Every band, when they start, they will hope to be what Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd can do now. That when you're in your 60s, you can announce we're going to do three reunion shows in a single city and sell out 100,000 seat stadiums in 14 seconds. Oh, yeah. Be in your yeah. 60s. It's, it's, be a band for forty over 40 years, 50 years, and sell out a show in 14 seconds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There will never be anything like Led Zeppelin again. Like, really, I don't know. Or maybe not never, but man, it's going to be a long time. And the way a pop culture is now, it's going to be really hard to, yeah. re to be something like that. Whereas when these bands were big, there was five TV channels. You got one rock radio station in your area. That's why everyone loved the same band. Because you, there was, how did you listen to anything else? In the world of streaming, when Spotify and YouTube and stuff re recommend you new indie artists all the time, you know, the next flavor every month, there's some new flavor that has caught your attention. There's it's going to be so hard for someone to be the, the Stones, or the Beatles or Led Zeppelin again. Well, let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. Um, I'm actually kind of interested to see where everyone's going to stand on this because we did point out some pothole stuff here, but there's still a strong episode buried in here. Let's go give our final thoughts. All right, I'm going to kick off this week. I mentioned some of the problems that I've had throughout this episode with how they treated Gina. And that's, I'm not going to beat a dead horse here on that. Said my piece with that. I think they did Gina wrong and they shortcutted it to the end to make it seem like, hey, Gina's okay with this. I still got major problems with how Gina was treated in this episode. So if we cut that out, what episode do we have here? We have a dirty lawyer who's going behind the, his client, trying to take care of himself, to selfishly take care of himself, who's also a former murderer. But the point of this episode is fruit of the poisonous tree. We have the vice team falling down pretty consistently on this case, which is something that's opposite of what we got in previous seasons. And I actually love that this episode called it out, said that vice team is getting information the wrong way and it's not going to hold up in court. We're going to show you in court that it's going to fall apart. And the typo thing was staying as a cop out, but Sonny getting that information from Amanda, that's a legit problem. And I love that this episode called it out and they're showing like that the team is slipping a little bit. Don't forget in the last episode, Stan was bugging the guy without a warrant. Yeah, they've been living dangerously for, for a few episodes now. Yeah, so I love that this episode called that out. This is a pretty good episode. It's pretty well balanced. We get a little bit from the whole team. Sonny riding in as a white knight at the end of every episode. It's getting kind of redundant. But this is a pretty good episode. I liked it. I thought, I thought it was okay. John, what are your final thoughts? Episode felt like the generic Vice episode just kind of stuck in the middle of things. I agree with you with Gina's storyline with it. It was a pretty good episode plot-wise, except it really didn't make... Uh, it really made Vice look very bad. They looked pretty incompetent about the entire episode as these lawyers were just taking advantage of them left and right. I was also curious... The fact that Polly essentially gets away with a coke of what we assume of about 152 
kilos of <laughs> coke drives away with a van of 152 kilos and a million dollars and like that just goes off into the sunset you know we never find out with that i mean at least we get a little bit of closure at the end at least someone gets arrested for it although uh based on the first two trials i don't think they're gonna have very much luck <laughs> trying to uh to make it stick there for R R romero good news is is that gina can just start dating him again and then they can just try it one more time you know <laughs> <laughs> Fourth time's a uh, term. So, Melissa, what are your final thoughts? I guess maybe I'm the lone one. I think this episode is really boring. I don't like this episode. <laughs> I think it's really boring. It's. I think it's very repetitive of what they've already done. We've seen so many things where it's like crooked lawyers, like the guy who flies the plane off and tries to leave in the island and all that stuff like that. I don't, I don't, I don't know. This is going to sound really bad. I don't care that her dad was murdered by that guy. <laughs> I'm like, that it comes down to like, I really didn't like her character. She's very unlikable <laughs> in every way. So I was like, I don't really care. And the lawyer is very swarmy and like, it's, he's the worst of the worst, right? Like he's not only is he getting people off that he knows are guilty, but he's also like a criminal himself. So, and I also felt like, I mean, I do understand that you're right. I, I will say that I agree that it's showing that they're getting sloppy and that they're getting like, they're too comfortable. Like they're just like, whatever. They're not really into this anymore. It's not like they're not passionate about doing their jobs anymore. They're just doing their jobs. And like Gina, basically that's what I would take it as is that Gina basically is like, whatever, I just have to do this. This is what I do. It's my job now. Like I don't have to have like morals and <laughs> standards anymore. I'm just going to do what I have to do to get it done with. So that part I, I understand. And I understand that's, that's an important part of like the season. But other than that, I could have done without it. Like, you could have just taken that episode out and I would have been like, okay, whatever. <laughs> Except for the guy wearing the same suit the whole time with the giant hair. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Roberto's hair is distracting. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, like, I don't... I, I will. And that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. Email us, GoWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Check out that website, GoWithTheHeat.com. You can find all the other ways to contact us. We would love to hear from you. We want to hear your take on this episode. We kind of cover the gamut from it was good to eh, to it's terrible. We kind of <laughs> heard all three uh. takes on this episode. We would love to hear from you. It's Especially, we would love to hear from you on how many meatballs Frank <laughs> bought with that million dollars and those 134 kilos of coke that he's got right now. You can get us on Facebook, facebook.com slash go with the heat, twitter.com slash go with the heat, instagram.com slash go with the heat. Do you know where we're at? We're at go with the heat. We're your favorite and bestest Miami Vice podcast on the <laughs> internet. There is not another Miami Vice podcast better than this one on that you're listening to right now. <laughs> we would love to hear from you. Check out that website, GoWithTheHeat.com. We would also like to see your support. Support step number one, go to that website, click on the support link, and find all the ways that you can support us. Support step number one, go leave us a review, iTunes, and give us five stars. Go ahead, just give us five stars. No, Apple will never know that I told you to give us five stars. They're kind of frowned upon that kind of stuff, but they'll never know. Just go ahead and give it five stars. And then in your review, write about how wrong Gina got played in this episode. I got a problem with Rob Bar Bragan and Michelle Manning. I'm looking at you two. You wrote and directed this episode. You did Gina wrong. Go write about how wrong Gina got in this episode in the iTunes review. Support step number two. Email us, go with the gmail.com. Let us know what your thoughts are on this episode. Support step number three. Check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal.